Well, I know you've had a lovely evening last night, and I have, I've heard what time everyone got back. So I know that the last thing you want is someone giving you some boring presentation. So you'll be relieved to know that all I'm going to tell you today, this morning, is I'm just going to tell you a story. So you can all sit back and listen to my life story, which I'm going to tell you for the next um, half an hour or so. Um, and my life story happens to be the story of an entrepreneur. Um, but just before I start telling you my life story as an entrepreneur, um, hands up those of you who, like me, consider yourselves entrepreneurs. Well, I'll ask again. Hands up those of you who, like me, consider yourselves a tiny bit entrepreneurial. <laughs> well, love, well, for those of you that didn't put your hands up, um, no worries, because um, if someone had asked me to put my hand up 11 or 12 years ago as to whether or not I was an entrepreneur, I would have never, ever put my hand up either. If someone ever asked me if I was creative, innovative, had any sort of leadership quality within me, I would have never, ever put my hand up either. Because when I was growing up in the 80s, there was just about one person, it seemed, who was entrepreneurial or creative, and that was Richard Branson. And you sort of compare yourself to Richard Branson and think, well, there's no way I am like Richard Branson. A, I didn't make my first million selling sweets at the school playground. Um, B, I didn't drop out of school in some controversial way. Richard Branson makes you feel like unless you dropped out of school, you're a complete loser, you know, with absolutely no creative leadership ability whatsoever. I didn't make any money peddling worms to my parents. So none of those kind of classic traits of really what a typical entrepreneur is. So I went, and instead of becoming an entrepreneur, I went and became the opposite of an entrepreneur. Um, I became a solicitor. And um, what I believe in life is that ideally you should do something in life that suits your personality. So that kind of who you are and what you do are the same thing. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a mix. The fact that you guys could all have gone out and had a great party together, which just means with your colleagues, just with, they're sort of like-minded, you can enjoy yourselves. And the problem I had being a lawyer is it just didn't suit my personality, because there's just about two things going for my personality. One, my optimism, the other, my enth enthusiasm. And very quickly I realized that unfortunately, just about the two qualities you didn't need to be a good solicitor were optimistic or enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> So I was sort of entirely wasted in what I did. And because I couldn't be myself in my job, I had to sort of put the work face on. What happened was every single day when I went to the office, I felt as if I was leaving kind of 40% of myself behind in the fridge and taking on this other 60% persona. And I remember thinking, it's such a waste. And I remember thinking, well, when you can't be all of yourself in your work, when you can't be your personality, you know, what your friends and family know at the weekends, the first thing that, that starts happening is you stop having fun. And I remember going to my colleagues and saying, guys, why can't we have fun at work? You know, why isn't this, why aren't we having fun? And I remember the answer they all gave me was, um, well, Sahar, they're not paying you to enjoy yourself. You know, who said work should be fun? Um, and to this day, for me, success is not about power, it's not about money. True success is actually loving what you do. Because let's face it, we're gonna be working the best years of our lives, most of our waking hours. Um, so my formal definition of success is the alarm goes in the morning and it's 4.35, 5.30, whatever, in the morning and, get up, and you get up and you think, you know what, it's bloody early and I'm really sleepy, but I can't wait to go to work. I'm so lucky that I love what I do. I'm in such a privileged position that I love what I do. I was telling this to a very successful UK entrepreneur. He said, no, Sahar, the real definition of success is sure enough, the alarm goes really early in, early in the morning and you get out of bed and you think, God, it's bloody early and I'm really sleepy, but I love what I do. I can't wait to go to work. I'm so lucky that I love what I do. But you can still afford to go back to bed. <laughs> it's <laughs> real success. Um, but anyway, that was very much the whole sort of dream for me. But I never really thought it was possible because I think, in a way, unlike what we are now in the companies you guys all work for, so it's just... Before, you know, anyone who worked in a company, you were sort of expected to leave your emotional baggage at the door. That's how it was. And very much like my dad's generation, that's how it was. I mean, you just couldn't bring, you, you couldn't be you at the office. You had to be employee number, whatever. So things have changed a lot. But at that time, I remember I just kept thinking, okay, that's fine. That, that's a compromise. Therefore, this is work. And 
you know, it's like kind of sort of punishment for life. And every day when I went to the office, it really sort of felt like a kind of life sentence almost. And by the end of it, not being able to be myself, I'd sort of lost any kind of enthusiasm or optimism I had, and I'd sort of resorted to bitching by the water cooler at any given moment, involved in all sorts of office politics. But anyway, I was sort of stuck in what I call my comfort zone. Um, and what I've learned in life is that um, whenever you're in your comfort zone, you've got to kind of constantly get yourself out of your comfort zone, because I find if you don't constantly move yourself and expand your comfort zone, expand the limits of where you're comfortable, something always happens and pushes you out anyway. Um, as they say, some adversity breeds creativity, and I believe that. And I learned this the hard way, kind of you know, stuck in this kind of rut in this law firm where kind of I wasn't going anywhere, I wasn't doing a good job of it. And um, something suddenly happened which sort of shook me up. I sort of got my wake-up call, in a way, my alarm call. Um, what happened to me was I come from a close family of four, my mum and dad, my brother and I. And in January 1993, my very healthy dad, who had actually just had a health checkup the uh, month before, um, he died in front of my eyes of a stroke, just suddenly, overnight. And I just remember um, leaving the hospital the next day, next morning, and coming back home. And it just dawned on me, sitting on my bed, I thought, actually, this whole idea of a comfort zone is actually a complete illusion. It's, in fact, a sort of complete false sense of security for anyone to remotely think they've got any sort of a comfort zone. So all I've just got to do is just, you know, I've got a short life and I've just got to do something I actually love doing every day. So I love what I do, so I'm engaged in what I do. So I decided to leave this law firm, had no idea what to do, where to go, but I just took, I just jumped kind of, and I took this leap. I took the first leap of my life. And since taking my first leap, my motto in life has actually become leap the net will appear. Um, I can tell you I've got this above my desk at home and actually I have taken many, many leaps since. But just for today, I'll tell you the story of the first leap I took, which I call my Coffee Republic leap. Um, basically, um, left this law firm, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I have a brother called Bobby, who features in my story, and Bobby is four years older than me. And um, he was working at the time in New York as an investment banker for believe it or not, Lehman Brothers. And um, so I just thought, okay, let me go to, let me sort of leave London, leave home, have a bit of change of air, use the fact that Bobby's in New York, kind of go there, and just sort of have a bit of change of perspective. And I remember I arrived in New York the very first morning. Um, I had terrible jet lag, as one does crossing the Atlantic. And I was looking for a cup of, I thought, let me go and get a cup of coffee. And back then, America had such horrible coffee that even we could afford to make fun of American coffee because basically you sort of went to a diner and then you get this like bottomless white mug and they pour this sort of filter coffee, like brown liquid essentially kind of into it. So I was looking for one of these diner cups of coffee. And I remember I was walking down Madison Avenue and literally I was sort of hit by this wall of coffee beans, um, this sort of smell. I don't know, kind of, you sort of, I'm sure you've all smelled now, this sort of smell of freshly ground coffee beans. And I remember I sort of smelt this wonderful freshly ground coffee beans on the pavement in Madison Avenue. And literally, like the Bisto kid, I sort of followed the smell inside this place called New World Coffee. And I kind of entered this place. Um, this is before Starbucks had even come to New York. Um, and so I just kind of entered this place, New World Coffee, and I just fell in love with, you know, they had all this stuff about coffee beans on the wall. I went to order my drink, and lo and behold, they had cappuccinos with full fat milk, semi skim milk, skim milk, soya milk always being on some sort of diet, I kind of couldn't believe you get skinny cappuccinos, and basically kind of muffins and everything was just different, all the kinds of sugar they had, all their cups were different. And I just fell in love with it, but very much fell in love with it the way, you know, you go abroad, you might go to France and you have a lot of pan au chocolats, or just, you know, just like that, nothing more than that. I was just tourists falling in love with something very New Yorky. 